So um, my guest this evening is Mr. John Mundy. Um, John is an author, a poet and a teacher. He's the publisher of Miracles magazine and the director of the Miracle Studies program for the All Faiths Seminary in New York. He's taught courses in philosophy, religion and mysticism. He's the author of 10 books and his newest book is A Course in Mysticism and Miracles. His previous book, Living a Course in Miracles, has become a perennial bestseller and has been published in eight languages. And we'll be discussing that this evening. He's produced 140 YouTube presentations on A Course in Miracles. Um, and of particular interest to me is the fact that John also appears on occasions as Dr. Baba John Mundane, <laughs> who um, I understand is a stand-up philosopher and comedian and um, I'm hoping to hear a wee bit about that tonight. You are? Well, we'll yeah. see. So we'll see. So um, a very, very warm Scottish welcome to you, John. Thank you. Um, I love your broke. <laughs> <laughs> did, I miss, did I miss anything? Uh, no. <laughs> Does that kind of cover it? It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So um, let, let's just kick off. Um what, what I'd be very interested in, John, is maybe just a wee bit about, about you and your background uh, and how you come to be involved in religion, spirituality, mysticism, Course in Miracles. You know, I believe you've had some, some very interesting experiences. I guess you could call them mystical experiences. Um, but I'd be very interested in just to hear a bit about your journey and how you came to be involved in um, all of this. So, All in one hour. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I've got a few. I've got a few other things I'd like to cover as well. We would like to talk about a course in miracles and uh, your book and yeah, your whatever you like. A kind of a kind of potted history, but I'm particularly interested in the the you know the spiritual aspect of of your journey and uh, how you came to be involved. All right. Well, I, so uh, simply put, if I can, I uh, grew up on a farm in Missouri during the 40s and the 50s. Um, very, very rural. Uh, when I went to college, I, I wound up becoming a minister of a local uh, rural church when I was 18 uh, and while I was in college. Um, I had an experience when I was 14. Uh, I guess you could call it a mystical experience. Very briefly, what happened was I was hunting. Uh, in the woods. Uh, I just got a new gun for a birthday. And um, there's a thing you do when you hunt that uh, we call freezing, which is you, you just stand perfectly still. And if you stand perfectly still, uh, the animals will not hear you. And uh, not for not for not downwind from you, they don't smell you. So um, they'll just sort of appear. And I was just standing there in this kind of Buddhist state. I don't know how else to describe it, kind of empty minded. And um, I sort of slipped out. I don't know how else to explain that, but it was like there was no hunter hunting. There was no thinker thinking. There was just this experience in the woods. And I started wondering what was having this experience. And it was like I heard this inner voice which said, uh, Who wants to know? I mean, that's all it said, just, just what, three, four words, just who wants to know. But it was like, whoa, where did that come from? And um, then there was all these rush of, of thoughts. Um, and, but I, they weren't from me. I didn't know how else to, to explain that. Um, so that was, it was nothing more than that, but it was so profound in and of itself that that was like a simple little door that, that kind of opened up, you know, right? And sorry, how long did that last for, John? Pardon? How long did that last for that experience? Oh, I don't know. No, just minutes. Yeah. You know, just minutes. Not 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 long at all. Uh, but it was enough to move me to to think that I had not done that myself. Uh, I don't know how else to explain that. But by having just got emptied, so to speak, then all of a sudden this other thing, this voice uh, appeared. Um, so I knew. I actually I knew at that point that I would spend the rest of my life uh, trying to answer that question. The question being, who wants to know? 
Hmm. But it's really a question that we all ask ourselves if you think about it. I mean, you know, what, what, why are we here? What are we doing? You know, yeah. all those guys. I, I also knew that I wasn't going to spend my life just uh, trying to earn money and raise a family and do the standard brand things, although that's a part of life too. Um, but I had to answer that, that question. So then I went to seminary in California and did my master's degree out there. Uh, served at church while I was in California and uh, came to New York to work on a doctorate. Uh, got a church that I was serving in Brooklyn, New York. At the same time, I very luckily uh, got onto the faculty at the New School University where I was doing the doctoral studies and teaching in the philosophy department. I proposed several courses on mysticism and my, to my surprise, kind of, um, they said, yes, I could, I could try offering these courses. Well, I got a lot of students, you know, this was this, keep in mind, it was in 1967, 68. It's like Greenwich village, New York city, uh, the dawning of the age of Aquarius, uh, music that's being played the, the Beatles and, yeah. uh, everything was different. You know, it was like this new, the pill had just come out not long before that. So there was this sort of sexual liberality that hadn't existed before. And uh, there was really the sense of something really new was, was going on. So these classes filled up and my head of the department was very happy. And I did that for 10 years. I, I stayed there and, and taught all that time, which really meant I just kept going deeper and deeper and deeper into exploring, I, I eventually created six different courses on mysticism, covering really different historical epochs. That would go from the ancient Egyptians and Greeks and Romans all the way up through contemporary times. And then in 1973, um, I had a book published called Learning to Die. I was at a conference in Chicago giving a talk. And two of the people who came to my lecture were Dr. Helen Shookman and Dr. Bill Thetford from the Creators of A Course in Miracles. I met them then. They didn't say anything to me about the course. They, they said something about Helen had written like this inspirational book. And she, Helen was like a short little woman with frizzy hair and big glasses. And I had just written a book, right? So, <laughs> so I look at Helen and I think, Wow, you know, the little lady wrote an inspirational book. Uh, probably got some, probably got some nice uh, prayers in it. It yeah. does. It has some very nice prayers in it. Uh, but that was our first meeting, and then that was nothing after that for about a year. And then I wrote a letter, which was published in the Journal of Transpersonal Psychology, expressing interest in being in contact with people who are working in the fields of psychotherapy and spirituality. Uh, Bill saw my letter told Helen he thought it was a call for her to complete the writing of the psychotherapy pamphlet. So after the Course in Miracles was done, Helen received two pamphlets from the same source. One was called Psychotherapy, Purpose, Process, and Practice. And the other is called The Song of Prayer. So she gave me the manuscript of that psychotherapy pamphlet. And I really remember walking home that night. It was just across town so I could walk. Um, carrying the manuscript, uh, thinking that probably the most important thing which ever happened to me just happened, mm -hmm. but I didn't know what it was. And it was a while before I began to understand the course. Uh, what really happened was that in, that was in 1975, April 75. In July of 76, a friend of mine who was very interested in shamanism uh, persuaded me to go with her. She was 17 years older than me. Uh, she's still, she's 93 years old now, and, and uh, still, I'm going to call her later today. Persuaded me to go with her to uh, Mexico to meet a shaman who was also a Mex Mexican psychiatrist who had, his name is Dr. Salvador Roquette. Uh, he was a public health doctor, uh, one of his jobs was taking medicine to the native peoples in the jungles and the mountains and, and Chiapas and Oaxaca and places like that. And the Indians were so grateful for, 
for him bringing his medicine that uh, they gave him some of their medicine, <laughs> which was usually, it was designed really to help um, people who were like psychotic within their own society break through their psychosis. Mm -hmm. So this was uh, psychosyllabin and, you know, things like that, Datura, et cetera. And uh, being a, a psychiatrist, Salvador realized that this was, uh, could be used in a therapeutic context. Uh, sometimes it takes a great deal to break through uh, to someone who's in a psychotic episode, but actually something like LSD, which was also becoming very you know, popular at that time. It was made illegal uh, just prior to that. Um, and so we went to Mexico, uh, we went into the jungles in Chiapas, and uh, we had some experiences there, which with Salvador uh, in a hut in the jungle, in sleeping bags, laying on a floor. Uh, we used LSD to start. Um, your eyes were covered so you couldn't see. Nobody could touch you, just laying on the floor. Headphones on so that you, music was being played in Salvador would put through there the kind of music that he wanted to put through there so you would have certain kinds of experiences. And at, during that time, um, and then you got a shot of ketamine. If you know what ketamine is, a, it's a very, uh, very powerful anesthetic uh, psychotropic. And what it does, it completely knocks out the muscular system of the body. So it's very good in operations. They use it for uh, on, in battlefield operations and for animal operations and for things where they can't, you don't have to have oxygen with it. And um, it can be used out in the open like that, like in a battlefield. And what it does is it completely knocks out, but the body just goes. You just, you can't hold on to your body. Uh, it, it just, it, it's like that, you're gone. But the mind is not gone because you're, you're way out there in, in outer space with the, the psychedelic. And I went through a death experience. Uh, I had to die. Uh, there was no choice about dying. I, I couldn't hold on to my body, and I, I lost me. I lost uh, identity, uh, space time, planet Earth, John Mundy, uh, all of it. It just um, disappeared. And it was very, very frightening, uh, horrifically frightening, because I, I had just these brief thoughts about what happened when my family found out that I died in jungles and Chiapas, and, you know, and, you know, all, but that was very brief because it, this, within seconds, actually, there was, that's about, it was just a, a second to remember that kind of thing. And then bang, I was gone. And um, when I came back, um, Salvador uh, made me, uh, well, he was very strong about that. I should tell him as much detail as I could. <clears throat> and start writing it down, what down, what happened. And so I, I did. And then I realized that, that this was the answer to a lot of questions I had about the Course in Miracles. I think the Course in Miracles is just incredibly clear, but you have to keep reading it and kind of reading it and reading it and reading it. The, the deeper you go, the more you begin to see what it's saying. And it's, it's, it's saying some of the things that I saw in this experience, like, that, that you're not a body. I, I was not a body. I had this experience of being disembodied from the body. There's no time because um, literally I stepped out of time. Time is an interesting, if you will, dimension that we live in. Uh, it's got past, present, future, but time, time itself is a part of the illusion according to the Course in Miracles. And um, so there's nobody, there's no time, there's no world. By that I mean there's nothing, there's nothing outside. There's nothing outside you. There's nothing outside of the mind. The mind contains it, contains it all, right? But the mind is not limited to a brain or to just a, a physical system. It's, it's universal. And we're all a part of it. And everything which is a mind is a part of it. That includes all of life, whatever life is animals, plants, but, and beyond us, you know, that's still going on. One of the interesting definitions of God, which appears in the Course in Miracles, every religion says that God's love, 
and the, certainly the Course says that, but it also says that God is life, and life is of the mind and in the mind. So, you know, that's where it's found. It's found in spirit. It's not found in the body. Everybody dies. Everybody dies in time, that we've got a definite time. You know, you, you're, there's a day you're born, and, you know, 90 years later or something, you're going to exit. And that's true for every human being on Earth. We're, we're slowly extending the time through medical science and proper nutrition and that sort of thing. But still, there's an end point. So that just got me so interested that I had several of those experiences. The, the first one was the most profound because I remembered it because it involved death. Later, when I would have those experiences, I would realize what was happening. And uh, I would realize that I had to die. And so I, to the lack of a better description, I would just kind of run and jump off a cliff. I mean, I just sort of disappear. And what, that's very scary, but it's not really because what the ego doesn't know is that what happens when you do that is that you fly. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but to the ego, no, you're going to die. No, you don't die, you fly. Yeah, so it's a very, <laughs> very, very different experience. And I can't really remember all those because um, I remember the first one so well because it was so terrifying. After that, it was just much more of a blissful kind of thing. So that's been my whole life has been writing about this and, and, and talking about not just that experience, but I've written two books on mysticism because I was teaching these classes and now I'd had this experience that the people were having as well, who, which happened for them. There's a whole variety of, of reasons uh, why one would have a mystical experience. Actually, everybody's had mystical experiences and has them, children especially, or young children especially, are subject to mystical experiences. Uh, angels are real, fairies are real, Santa Claus is real. I mean, they don't question that stuff. You know, you, you got to get sober and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> become mature and, and by the by the program of the world of that you're looking at is giving you right now. Right? Yeah. And you start buying that program and you think that's what the world is. Uh, fortunately, that's not what the world is. Um, I could keep running on, but, but you asked me, that's kind of how it all got started. And uh, then the course became slowly my life. I was working as a minister at the time. That eventually came to an end because uh, when they got wind of my experiences in Mexico, they decided that that was, I, that was too far out. Um, so <laughs> even though I had a good church and I was enjoying myself and I loved being with the people and uh, it's a really good job giving sermons every week. You have to think things through and try to communicate this message to people. And so anyhow, that, that's it. Then I started a magazine 35 years ago. I call miracles and just keep it's so much fun having a purpose and meaning and 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 doing what everybody's trying to do anyhow but uh to figure out again why we're here and how do you get out of here i mean how do you get out of here safely i mean how do you get out of here sanely you know how do you how do you not let this world drive you insane? Yeah. You know, one of the things, of course, a miracle says that this is an insane world. And if you look at it right now, it, it really appears to be, I mean, the COVID thing is, is like, you know, yeah. people going crazy. Right. But it's just a part of, it's just a part of this world. So it takes, there's a section in the course called above the battleground. So which really means that you need to kind of get up to this other place and you sort of look down, you sort of see the game, you see the play, you see the drama, you see the soap opera, and you just don't play. You, you just, Ken Wapnick, who was really my teacher of the course and the leading teacher for a long time, one of his favorite lines was, um, um, don't, don't start throwing sand, don't the sandbox and start throwing sand around. Now that's, that's just remain objective so that you can really see. And it's hard sometimes to remain objective, but yeah, yeah. it can be done. Uh, let me stop. I think I've thrown quite a bit at you in the past. Well, that, that's, uh, there's so much, so much there, John. Um, so many things I'd like to um, expand and elaborate on, but maybe I could just backtrack slightly. Um, I'm kind of pitching this, this conversation. I'm kind of assuming I'd like to 
it to be an introdu introduction to A Course in Miracles, maybe for people who have never came across it before. So I'm just going to backtrack slightly and um, just let people see this This is A Course in Miracles here. Um, as you say, it's a, it's a complicated um, piece um, and it takes, it's a life, it's lifelong work really, isn't it? Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, most people, most people who, who, who begin to read it, um, a lot of people will maybe put it back on the shelf for 10 years and, and then go back and look at it. That again. happens a lot. Yeah, that happens a lot. Um, but um, this, this is the reason why a book like this, um, which is your book called Living A Course of Miracles, is uh, so valuable because yeah. uh, what it actually does is it provides a bit, it's like a, a can opener. <laughs> it gives it gives people um, an opportunity to begin to make sense of some of these complex ideas because they are radical. They're profound. Um, yeah, it's radical. It, it, it takes a long time to really begin to get your head around it. And uh, I'm fascinated to hear. I hadn't heard that story about the jungle and the the experience with um, hallucinogenics. And, um, you know, that, that must have, as you say, it must have been terrifying, you know, just the experience. Well, that. It, that's, that's why people are afraid of death. You know, they're, they're afraid that they're going to be gone forever. And that's not what happens. But yeah. you got to go through that tunnel before you, you realize that that's not, you don't die. The body dies. Yeah, the body, yeah. everybody dies. Yeah. Yeah, you can help that. Uh, but you don't die. <laughs> yeah. What, what I was going to do is maybe just read a couple of lines uh, by way of a kind of introduction really to, like. to the book. So so you, you open by saying, A Course in Miracles is the wisest, sanest, deepest book I know. It is a unique spiritual document, a self-instructional textbook, eloquent in, in loveliness and level of psychological sophistication. It is a modern spiritual classic regarded by many as the most important book since the Bible. Now that's pretty, <laughs> that's quite a, quite a statement, isn't it? Um, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's quite a statement. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a big statement. Um, so again, you know, for, for people who, who have never read A Course in Miracles, don't, don't know anything about it, um, you know, what would you, what would you say are the kind of main themes you know, what does it cover? What's the sort of main principles? One of the things I've been reflecting on, and you've reflected on it at the moment, is people do have, because of this whole COVID pandemic, global pandemic, um, the idea of death <laughs> and the potential for yourself to die. And, you know, many people have experienced the loss of loved ones uh, in this pandemic. And a lot of people, a lot of people are thinking, you know, I could die, and people are people are being confronted with that question. Um, right. You know, uh, I've been thinking about this for most of my life, like yourself. <laughs> you know, I've been asking myself these deep questions. You know, what's it all about? What happens when you die? Is there a God? Um, does God love me? Am I going to hell? You know, blah 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 blah. <laughs> I was <laughs> I was brought up as a as a Catholic, and. Um, and um, I'm sure you can touch on this, but you know the the unholy trinity, sin. Uh, what is it? Sin, guilt, and fear. You know, God loves you, but if you don't do what you're told, you're going to hell. So, you know, in terms of programming and conditioning, uh, I've been um, brought up to believe that you know God is this um, you know white man in the sky with a big long beard who's watching everything you do. And if, um, although he loves you, but if you don't, if you don't do what you're told, then there's a fiery hell for eternity for you waiting. You know, so <laughs> I've had to, I've had to work through that process. And um, so, if you could, if you could maybe talk a bit about, you know, of course, a miracles perspective on, you know, religion. What, what is it? Is it religion? Is it a philosophy? Is it no, a sorry, training really. program? You know, is it a sect? You know, what, what is it in, in essence? How would you describe it? All right. So let me just give a couple of minutes first about how we got this book. Uh, it, it, it happens with a woman uh, whose name is Dr. Helen Shuklin, who was a, 
research psychologist and professor at Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons in New York City, uh, beginning in 1965 in conjunction with her boss, who was Dr. William Tetford, who was head of the Department of Psychology at Columbia University in New York City. And just a little bit about Helen. Um, Helen uh, grew up in New York City, Park Avenue, wealthy, they're a maid and a cook and all that kind of stuff. Um, atheistic in background and belief. Her father was a militant atheist, uh, Jewish background. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but Helen had these like psychic experiences. Even when she was a child, she would uh, have visionary experiences. Um, and so she was sort of like b divided because on the one hand, you know, she's atheist, but she's very much of an intellectual. So, she, you know, she went back and got her doctor like that when, when she was 40 years old and did it very quickly. And she just made straight A's and uh, no problem and right into professorship at, at Columbia not long after. And yet at the same time, she was open to these transcendent experiences. And she told Dr. Thedford at her boss at Columbia about what was happening. And <clears throat> He suggested that she start writing down some of this stuff. Well, she kept a kind of a, a record of her dreams and visions. <clears throat> and so one day in uh, the fall of October, actually, of 1965, she's writing about an experience. And there appears the phrase, this is a course in miracles. Uh, please take notes. And, and she did. <laughs> she started taking notes for the next seven years. Mm -hmm. And it masked itself up, as you say, into this. Uh, we've got a, a textbook of uh, 669 pages and a workbook of 365 lessons and a manual for teachers. And like you say, it's, it's, it's complex, but it's not. It's really very simple. Uh, I think one of the problems is that you need to be simple in order to hear the course. It's and that's the benefit of this, because it's a, a layman's guide to it to start with, isn't it? It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a layman. I'm working on another one now, which is like a step beyond that. I like that. So that's beginner. I'm doing an intermediate yeah, yeah. kind of study, you yeah. know, where it's like a little bit more like it's going to be a bigger book and in more detail and all that. But uh, But still talking about some of those important concepts and principles of the course. The book I'm re working on now is called The Power of, of Responsible Decision-Making mm -hmm. because that's kind of what the course comes down to. It comes down to how do we see and whether or not we're making responsible choices in life. I mean, what we were choosing, the course is very different than some of the other spiritual philosophies out there in the sense that it puts this very strong emphasis upon the fact that first of all, we have divided minds. Now, what do I mean by divided minds? We have two minds. Uh, actually, there's a word for it. It's called agathocacological. That's 17 letters long. Say that again. Agathocacological. It's a <laughs> real word. <laughs> uh, it's not in the course. I know. It's just. It was. I came across it one day in, in big words in the in Reader's Digest or something like that that I was reading. Uh, actually, an Englishman created it many years ago. Um, and it just means that we, we, we're split. We're, we're, we're two. We're, on the one hand, we, there's this ego thing which seems to run our lives uh, all the time. And at the same time that this ego, which and it can almost completely take over. The good news is, of course, is it never, it can't take over 100%. If it it, there's always like this little piece of light that's still inside every mind that can't go out. You know, there's that, and that little piece of light is still connected to the divine light. Our task is one of getting back to the point where that little light comes in whoop, flame, and then you can see in the dark, you know, quite, low, quite literally. So there's two voices. There's the voice of the ego. And then on the other hand, there's the, the voice of God. Uh, which the Course identifies as the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is really the author of A Course in Miracles uh, because Jesus says <clears throat> in the Course 
that the same voice that he heard is available for everyone. And I think if, if you look at the Jesus story, if you look especially at the, the wandering in the wilderness story, now that, that experience happens before there's, there's not one single word of ministry until after that event. In fact, he goes into the wilderness. He does this fasting. And by the way, if you want to have a mystical experience, I guarantee you, very easy, simple, easy way to have a mystical experience. Just go out to the desert for 40 days and 40 nights and don't eat anything. <laughs> <laughs> and before it's over, you will start having mystical. <laughs> I'm not really recommending that anybody do that. But <laughs> there's, well, there's probably there's probably other, other means uh, that you could maybe... You know, in terms of practical things you can do to to de to develop your spirituality, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that sounds pretty. Meditations for too. That's in in part of the in, the intention of meditation is really to get us down to the point where to take out the empty mind or the quiet mind. So we begin to quiet down the ego mind enough, and if you if you can kind of shut it out enough then you begin to become receptive. And the, the course is about being receptive to a thing that a lot of folks are receptive to. We call it inspiration. You know, you get inspired. And poets are often very receptive to this kind of thing. And the poets very often will say, I don't know where that came from. I just got that. I mean, that just like this, this flows or musicians, they'll, get, they'll, they'll start creating a piece. They'll, they'll hear it. You know, Mozart said he never wrote his stuff. He heard it. He heard it. It's interesting. It's one of my favorite my favorite movies is Amadeus, and uh, it's quite it's quite interesting. At one point, um, the the protagonist, the other protagonist, um, has a look at his work, and he, he says, "Have you got some copies?" And his wife says, "Well, he didn't make copies. He just he just wrote it down. There were all originals in it, and it kind of looked like he he was dictating this stuff onto the page. Do you know? Um, I think you're right." Exactly. Well, see, that's what, so, so Helen has this mind that can kind of close to its own insanity. At the same time, I must say that Helen had trouble with this by, by having trouble with it. I mean, on, you know, the ego uh, was, spirit is kind of like bouncing back and forth in her and she could hear the course and, and write all this down with, with clarity. But when it came to practicing the principles of the course, I mean, to actually doing what the course was asking you to do, she struggled with it, just like we all do. Actually, I think Bill Thetford, her boss, was the first person to really get it. I mean, to really understand what it was saying. Yeah. One of the things that's so unique about the course is that it has this profound um, psychological base. I once said to Ken Wapnick, who was really the leading spokesman for a course in miracles, uh, who died really uh, unexpectedly in, back in, in December 27, 2013, uh, just totally, uh, well, anyhow, Ken was the man <laughs> when it comes to understanding and teaching the course. And he was uh, right there with Helen all the time. Once he got the course and understood it, uh, he was a mystic to start with, let's put it that way. So it made it easy for him, but he was also a PhD psychologist. So he was able to hear this, right? So then it came to, when it came to the practical application, Ken was very good at that. Uh, but Helen, Helen could be alarmingly judgmental, for example. And it's like one of the major things in the course is no judgment. You know, we don't, we don't, that's ego. Ego makes judgments about the world. You know, you have to kind of leave that leave that alone. I can see, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, I can see that it must have been really difficult for Helen because here you've got, you know, rational thinking, yeah. atheistic minded, clinical yeah. individual, um, you know, and and this is coming at her sort of left of center, you know, and she, she, she must have experienced a lot of tension, distress, you know, yeah. starting to hear voices. I mean, I, I work in the field of mental health, um, and in the in the mainstream arena, um, you know, although it's becoming more and more acceptable now in terms of hearing voices, um, but you know, historically within the, the sort of psychiatric uh, industry, you know, if you heard voices, then it was automatically assumed that, that you had a mental disorder, uh, you know. So, 
it must have been very, very difficult for her to make sense of this to start with. Uh, yeah, it, it was. You know, on, on the one hand, she was perfectly sane. By that, I mean, uh, you know, I would meet with her on occasion. She was like my therapist. And uh, she was incredibly helpful and very rational and knew exactly what to tell you and how to guide you in the, the life journey process. Um, she was always completely quote, uh, normal <laughs> in public, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, at the same time that that was true, she was struggling with, with why, why her? I mean, why, why did she, well, first of all, she had the intellect for it. Secondly, she was open to it. Um, she had this ability to hear. She also understood psychology really well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I once said to Ken Bobnick, why did, why did we get this course done? Why did this come to us during the latter quarter of the 20th century? And he said he didn't know the answer to that for sure, but there was something he was sure of. And the thing that he was sure of is that it couldn't have happened until after Freud. Now, I might add it not only after Freud, but after Freud and Jung yeah, and all yeah. the depth psychologists mm -hmm. who were beginning to point out, hey, folks, there's a lot more going on in there. Yeah than just what we see out there in the world. You know, there's a, an unconscious and there's a collective unconscious and those things are pretty operative as well. One of the things what happens with people who work with psychedelics in that sense, they get into the collective unconscious. Yeah. And that's a much, much, much bigger world, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we don't normally, it's there for everybody and you kind of know it like, Okay, let's take nature has its own mind, let's say, or trees have a mind, yeah. right? It's not anything like our mind, but there's a kind of communication that's going on through the roots and things with each other. Yeah, yeah. That you can then begin to become aware of when you open the mind starts opening up in that kind of a way. Well, anyhow, that's the point. It's, it has this incredible depth of psychology to it as well. So it's like the Bible in a way, but it's the Bible with modern 20th century psychological principles in tow. Yeah. So now, yeah, now we can take another step. Now we can understand why the mind works the way it does yeah. and how we can get out of our insanity. I mean, really get out of our insanity yeah. instead of just putting it in abeyance for a little while. Yeah. Let, me, let me just come back to this. Uh, I mean, the conventional view of Comparing and contrasting, perhaps, of course, miracles with the Bible, teachings of Jesus, etc. Um, you know, the conventional view would be the um, this idea of sin, and you know, from from Catholicism's perspective, there's different levels of sin, and there is the potential for you to be, you know, to go to hell and burn in a sulphur fire for eternal damnation. Do you know, um, but of course, in miracles is <laughs> quite radically different from that perspective, and and suggests that maybe we kind of got Jesus wrong a bit. Um, can you say a bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, in the very simplest form, and 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 don't take this wrong, folks. Uh, <laughs> let me explain it a little bit. Uh, there is no sin. Now, what I mean by that i mean of course there are mistakes that we make and there were trouble we get into and and there are things that we we label as, as sins or the course would refer to these simply as mistakes or misguidance or you know going down the wrong path there's nothing there's absolutely nothing that is uh unforgivable um uh, in fact as interestingly enough before coming on to the show with you i was just writing a piece for uh i i send out a little epistle every sunday morning i yeah. And I, my basis is the story of the prodigal son. Yeah. So the, the story of the prodigal son, see, Jesus taught using parables, which is really great. I, I would kind of like to do a book on the Course in Miracles and Jesus' parables because, I mean, th it's kind of all in there in the parable and you kind of get it, you know, what it's saying. And what the parable of the prodigal son says is, here's a son, you, me, us, we, we say, God essentially, well, thank you very much, God, but I'd really rather do it myself. You know? mm -hmm. and, and, and then God says, okay, here's your inheritance. <laughs> and then he goes off and spins along on wanton living and, and gets insane about the world. Well, the answer is not in the world. You're not going to find it out there. I don't care how much pleasure you get or how much money you get. Or how. And one of the interesting things about egos, 
is they always implode. They always, they, they will eventually crash and burn. They, they can't keep it up. Uh, just, you, you just can't keep it up. We've been, we've seen that here politically in the United States yeah, past, yeah. Past, past number of months, right? Yeah. So um, what happens in the prodigal son story is that when the guy is down at the bottom of the pit eating corn with pigs, right? And he has a revelatory experience. Now, this is all an allegory, but so it's a great allegory. And what it says there is when he came to himself, it's an interesting line. When he came to himself, he said, I, I can go home. I can go home. I, I, and I'll say to Father, Father, I sinned against you before heaven. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, which is exactly what he does. Mm -hmm. And what does the Father do? He didn't say a word about what he went, where he went or what he did. Yeah. The only thing he says is get a gold ring and put on his finger, get some sandals, put them on his feet, put a cloak on him. In other words, his status is being restored. The, the important thing was he was lost. He, he would he was dead as far as his, the father's world was concerned. Now he's back home again. And that's nothing happened. You made these mistakes and you got into all this trouble. And it was you you weren't happy there at all, but it, you realized that you could come. The course is about are coming back home again, waking up to the reality of who you are in truth. And in who you are in truth, you're loved of God. Uh and you're just welcome back home. Many, but you've got to come to that realization yourself. You've got to wake up. The Course is about, as are most all Buddhism, lots of depth psychology, spiritualities, it's about having some kind of an awakening experience along the way. There's two ways you can wake up in the broadest sense. One is gradually. You know, you, you, you become more and more and more and more aware and more aware. that As you study the Course, that's what should happen. As you're studying the course, you find you're becoming more and more and more aware, and more and more and more aware. The other pathway is that it happens suddenly for some reason, um, and it just that you, you you see it. Psychotropics are one of the ways that facilitate that process of it happens suddenly, but it can happen other ways. For suddenly, an accident or something like that. Actually, uh, we know from research on mystical experiences that more people wake up from crash and burn experiences than any other way. I mean, yeah. they come to some sort, then the course talks about that. It talks about what it calls extreme experiences, extreme experiences where you really like a death experience. There's a lot of similar death experiences and near death experiences and mystical experiences. They're really right there. The, the same kind of door is opening up, right? So when that ha happens, this opening occurs, it's kind of, it's much more gentle for it to happen slowly. <laughs> You know, it's this. That's the thing people fear, though, is the, the hell. There's no such thing as hell. But the death of the ego is hellish. Yeah. On the part of the ego, because it looks like to it that it's a goner, you know, and, and in a sense, it is. I mean, the ego is a goner. But one thing we really need to keep in mind from the get go is understanding that. Actually, there is no such thing as an ego. There's no such thing. You yeah. can't, it does not exist because there's nothing outside of the mind of God. You can't exist outside of the mind of God. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I remember um, when I first picked up the course, reading reading those uh, two lines. Um, nothing, nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Uh, right, right. And, 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 I, and I looked at it and I thought, are you having a laugh? Seriously? <laughs> really? You know, and then, and then it, I mean, it's, it takes years to sort of process that, that, you know, okay, so um, what is real? What's not real? Um, and if you think, as you spoke about, you know, uh, eventually, you know, we're all going to die. And this is, this is uppermost in people's minds at the moment. Uh, the the fear the fear of death and we can talk about fear as well and what of course has to say about that, but um, the the we we have to you know I came to the re the realization or the conclusion that okay if if the body dies then that's not real, yeah, so so the question then arises well what is real, right, uh, and what is real is uh, is what is permanent, and um, 
you know, and if you look at it from a spiritual perspective, then then spirit is real because it's forever, it's permanent. That's um, right. Yeah. So spirit is the thing which gives life. Yeah. And life is real. Yeah. Yeah. But again, I said a moment ago, life is in the mind and of the mind. It's not something external. That's it's we are our perception tells us that what's real is what's out what's what I'm seeing out there. Yeah. And what we don't understand is that what we're seeing out there is something that we're constantly evaluating and judging as pretty or ugly or nice or not nice or whatever it is. So we're putting all the definitions onto it. I'm not saying that things like books and cups and stuff don't exist in some physical way they do, but what if, what if you weren't here anymore? That's kind of an interesting thing. What if, what if you were gone? <laughs> yeah. Does it exist if, if you're not here to see it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so um, the whole the whole fear thing, um, I think, uh, I always refer to it as false evidence appearing real. Um, yeah. You've probably heard that before, but it's a big part of the human condition because first of all, first of all, we're animals, um, and our first inst instinct is, uh, do I feel safe? Do I feel secure? Um, is there any immediate threat to me uh, at, at the sort of primal level? And I think people people are feeling more of that now, because of the um, you know, because of the whole COVID thing, and it's it's kind of forcing people to uh, ask themselves the bigger questions. And I I think it's quite interesting times because there is um, I, I I was I'm reading a book just now called The Imperative of Transcendence, and suddenly there's there's more of an urgency I think around. Um, for for people to have answers to these questions, you know, right. you know, who am I? What am I? Do I die? You know, um, do do you have a sense of that, John? Oh, absolutely, and and I think that's one of the reasons that that we're having this experience right now. Yeah. It, it it may seem strange to say this, but it's actually part of the waking up, the, the universal waking up. Yeah, because it's forcing people to do what you're talking about. It's forcing people to look at those questions you know, who am i why why am i here and because it's forcing us to do this then it's going to open up it's also going to open up answers for a lot of people yeah and they're going to see that those answers are not within the traditional church i mean it's not it could be but you know on, on the whole churches are dying very very rapidly because they don't they're not answering these questions yeah that like, and, and that's one of the reasons this is going on. We have to go deeper to get to the real answers. It's not something that's consistent laws and creeds and dogmas and rules and regulations. Enough of that. I want to figure this out for myself. Yeah. I mean, that's what people are saying. And that's people have got to figure it out for themselves. Otherwise, it's not real. Right. That's why we got to go into the depth psychology behind it. Yeah. And, and I think I think you're right. Um you know, you've had some very, very deep and personal experiences and uh, the felt experience, the real experience, which is subjective, um, I think that's what people are looking for. And it's quite interesting, there's been a real resurgence in interest in psychedelics, you know, with people going to the, you know, Brazil for the ayahuasca experience. Um, there's the, the people that experiment in the mental health field, they're, they're, they're now beginning to look seriously at the, the, the potential value of um, psychedelics uh, in treating mental illness. Um, you know, there's, there's, th th that's coming on leaps and bounds. And, and I think that partly that is recognizing that whilst um, psychiatric medications uh, can be effective, um, they are not without their limitations as well. And um, you know, so I think even the medics are getting frustrated with the treatment of certain conditions, which are, you know, seem to be, um, you know, a lot of the the conventional approaches are, are not working. So they're looking looking elsewhere, and I think that's a good thing. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the problems with the the some of the previous conventional approaches, especially in terms of uh, dr drug therapy, is a lot of those are just supposed to like they press you down and and, and keep you quiet. And, and what has to happen, actually, is you've got to face this. You've got to look at that yeah. straight on and, and get through it. Yeah. And when you look at it straight on and you get through it and understand that there is no such thing as death, that's a very, very, very different perspective than kind of keeping you unconscious or keeping you yeah. in a 
La La Land rather than yeah. sort of dumbed down. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how how that how that progresses and how that how that evolves. Um, you know, introducing these sort of psychotropic stuff medications. Well, medicines. Had, I hear. Let me get you this book. Um, didn't give us. I want to hold it up for you. The most interesting book, and um, I wasn't planning on doing this, but let me, let me get it. Uh, I've read this twice uh, already um, in the past couple of months. This is called Elden and the Mind of the Universe by his name is um, Christopher Bache, uh, yeah. PhD. Just a little word about this. Um, and I want to have, I have a show and I want to have him come on my show at some point. Uh, very, very briefly, um, he was a professor of, of religion and philosophy at Youngstown University in Youngstown, Ohio. And over a course of 20 years, he had 73 sessions by himself, didn't tell anybody about it. He was working as a, he was a tenured professor, right? Yeah. Very respected all the way through. Nobody knew what he was doing except for his wife. Yeah. The only person they thought. 70 over the course of 20 years he went through 73 of these experiences <clears throat> and it just opened him up tremendously right and then after he retired after he put his 40-year stint in as a professor uh still nobody knew <laughs> uh he, he he wrote this book and several other books as well describing what the process that he went through in this but, so things are really i think what happened back in the 60s and the early 70s was that the authorities got afraid, you know, they, they got afraid and they thought, and so it got classified as a, mm, yeah. a, in the wrong kind of classification. And Timothy Leary didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> when I say he didn't help, I meant, uh, you know, turn on, turn in, drop out. Well, the authorities are not going to listen to that. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> you, they're, they're ruining our kids, you know, well, so it all goes. Really good guys like uh, Terrence McKenna, you know, he was. Uh, I've read. I've read some of Terence's stuff as well. You know, he, what was he? He said about um, taking um, DMT. He said somebody. Somebody asked him. He says, "Should I be afraid of taking DMT?" And he says, "No, not unless you're scared of death by astonishment." <laughs> <laughs> Say again, the last line. Uh, somebody asked him, "Should I be afraid of taking DMT?" And he he says, "No, not unless you're afraid of death by astonishment." And death by <laughs> yeah, well, and it, so, it sounds like I think it sounds like you might have experienced that death by astonishment in terms of what you opened sure. yourself up. Yeah, to. that's kind of what happens, you know. But which is really waking you up. Yeah, you know, you don't realize that, that it's really an awakening. That, but it lies on the other side. But what what he also said was that he discovered that when you dive into the abyss. Um, you land on a feather bed. <laughs> it, it, that's what well, that's what I mean by jumping off the cliff. Yeah, yeah. I mean you, you don't you just don't realize because you you jump off a cliff. But you see the problem with that is that you're still thinking of yourself as a body. Yeah. A body. If you, you you jump off a cliff with your body, you're gonna die. Yeah, yeah you're in trouble. <laughs> in terms of the body's gonna <laughs> the body's gonna crash for sure. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about something that strictly happens on the mind level, not on the physical yeah. level. What the Course is getting to, which is really, you can't go far in studying the Course without understanding the basic metaphysics of the Course. Yeah. And, and once you begin to, and, and the metaphysics of the Course to the ordinary ego-oriented mind don't make sense at all. Uh, let me. I've written a piece called "The Four Great Illusions." Uh, it's going to be my next book. It's a chapter, and let me just tell you: the, there are four great illusions. All right, the, the Course in Miracles never ever says this, but it, it does talk about four illusions. The four illusions are: number one, you're a body; you're not a body. The body is a very brief experience in space time. It's out, out, brief candle. Life support player that stretches and frets the tower up on the stage. Some other famous Englishman said that, right? And um, so this, this, you're not a body, <clears throat> simply because anything that's in time, time is an illusion. So time is an illusion, the body's an illusion, time is an illusion, because, well, 
it's the body is an illusion because it's destructible. What's eternal is not destruct. God is not destructible. Love is not destructible. Anything that you can destroy that can rust or rot or decay or yeah. turn from one form into another form has no eternity in it. Right? The mind has eternity in it, but not the physical thing itself. Everything decays over time. Right? In other body, there's no time. Time is where the story is. Time is where the drama is. Time is where the soap opera is. And what happens with everyone, really, is you get caught in the story. You get caught in the drama. You get caught in time. And then you think that's all what's, what's going on in politics, for example, yeah. or what's going on in the church or whatever is going on in society, that what's, what's in the newspapers, what's on the news, that's what's real. Well, no, 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 that's, that's the local drama. That's this week's soap opera. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> that's what, so there's no world, there's no time, there's no you. Now, when I say there's no you, I mean there's no ego. So there's no none of that kind of identity kind of thing, all right? Um, so those are the four. The, 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 you're not a body, there's no time, there's no world, and there's no you. By you, I mean, I sometimes tell people, and, and they can, people even got up a little bit, I say, there, there won't be a John Monday in heaven. And, and they don't like, no, 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 why not? You know, it's like, because there's no body there. I mean, there's no... It, it doesn't work like that, you know. It's. I once read a, a a sermon that was written by a 19th century minister, uh, in which he described heaven as this place where these really fine horses and carriages. You know. <laughs> well, he's worked. You know, in the 19th century, well, what do we have? We had horses. You know, what now? We're going to go to heaven, and there's going to be Maseratis and. <laughs> <laughs> And as the, the cultural context there. Yeah. It's not like that, you know. That's but we're being forced out of the old form. And part of what's the COVID and things are like that are forcing us out of that so that you we can see. We can see with a much broader perspective. This is all gonna come back. And when it comes back, it's gonna come back in a better way. Yeah. So, but in the meantime, I, we're we're in this transitional period, and it it's painful for people, um, painful for all of us if you if you've not been through that, oh, that process of beginning to reflect on the on the deeper questions. It's very, um, you know, the level of chaos that the potential chaos, um, yeah. or, you know, discomfort that people are are feeling, um, you know, and 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 I think you're right in terms of the. I suppose maybe this, as you say, this is the benefit of something like A Course of Miracles because there is the potential to gradually and slowly expose yourself to, right. to this in a way that's manageable, yeah, without jumping off the cliff. Yeah, yeah. without jumping off the cliff, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but, but, you know... I also feel there's there there is a sense of uh, a sense of urgency around that people want questions and people want questions quick. We live in a consumer society. You know, can I buy this? Can I can I pay a hundred dollars and and get this? Um, you know, fast track. Um, you know, but there's no easy way through it. You know, you can't cross a chasm in two small steps. You've got to you've got to engage in that process, and it can be. It's going to be. It's going to be painful for people. Well, yeah, and a part of the really painful part right now, and I really sympathize with everybody who's going through this, is um, the loss of loved ones. I mean, you know, you, you, you this is a major. I mean, you, you, this is you love this person. This is an ma- important part of your life, and all of a sudden they're not there. Yeah. I mean, wow, they're not there. I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you deal with that? You know, how do you understand who you are within that context? Right. Yeah. So that's that's the that's the most difficult. I don't. The problem is not with the people who go. By that I mean, yeah, yeah uh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, I mean, they get to find out more than, than we can begin to imagine on with those of us who still work within the context of space time. Yeah. Planet Earth. Right. Yeah. Okay. So um, I suppose in in um, in kind of practical steps. What, what would, you know, somebody who's embarking on this journey, who's maybe presented with, you know, this question, maybe for the first time in their life, they're having to face this distress, uh, anxiety, fear, do you know, um, you know, what in practical terms 
can can people do to to begin this this journey? I think the the primary thing that we need, and I, I see that it's a lot going on, particularly in American politics at the moment, but it probably is true all over the place. Is is understanding that, that the problem is not out there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the problem isn't in the world. The problem isn't in other people, and and it's not in fixing other people, and it's it's. You know, all this stuff between conservatives and liberals and, you know, Democrats and Republicans and leftists and rightists. I mean, the, enough of that. That's the, there's a centered place with inside you and me and the mind that can really see. And our job really is to get quiet in, in the presence of that and to work from that centered. That's one of the reasons I like Buddhism a lot, because Buddhism is a lot about getting into the centered state where you can begin to see yeah. without the craziness, without the insanity that's going on in the world. Yeah. So if I'm, if I'm engaged in attacking the world in any way, yeah. if I'm saying you need to be fixed, the problem is out there, sometimes I, I'll, I'll tell students, um, if you don't get anything else out of, especially when I'm doing like an introductory presentation, if you don't get anything else out of this, get here's two really simple things. Number, just do not attack. I mean, don't don't attack the world. It's not the, the problem isn't in the world, right? It's it's not out there. And the, the course at one point says anger is never justified. The word is never. It's never, you know, again because it's nothing external. And then the other side of that is is don't defend. And and the reason for don't defend is because. There is no ego to defend. What are you defending? You're defending a, a silly ego, and that doesn't even exist. You know that's not who you are, and and that's actually what Jesus is doing, going to the cross, which is traditional Christianity really got that one twisted around backwards. Uh, he's really just going there to show us that there's no such thing as death. I mean, look at this. There's this most you know, outrageous thing one body can do to another body, and uh, it doesn't affect him at all because he knew who he was. He knew that he was not a body, right? So, uh, and he's really trying to show us that, to come to that same under. That doesn't mean you should go out and do away with your body uh, because we're here for a reason. And the course is very clear about that. There's a, there's a program or a plan. The course calls it God's plan for salvation. So it's GPS. And, and if you just follow that, begin to follow this program, program or this plan which is there for you it will open up your mind and you will be able to see in a very peaceful kind of way how it is that you respond to other people and just a word about how to respond to other people the, the main thing is to realize that is you <laughs> you know what i mean by that is i love the definition of jesus that appears in the course it's, it's in the manual for teachers and it says, Jesus was a man who saw the face of Christ in all of his brothers and sisters and remembered God. How did he remember God? By seeing the face of Christ, reflecting back to him and all of his brothers and sisters, like looking in a mirror, right? And there is no difference. God has no favorite children. You know, we're, we're all sons and daughters of God. We're all blessed, right? So we all have to come to that realization for ourselves. But we, here's the thing, you come to it by seeing it in your brother and in your sister. That's where the love comes in, right? Yeah. That's also on the sad part. When, when we lose a brother or sister, uh, then we have to, those of us who are still here, we have to deal with that. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, just to sort of develop the what you were saying there, John, about um, this idea is that attack is never justified. Um, yeah. I think people who are listening to this are probably thinking, well, some sometimes you know there are exceptions. You know, I can think I can think of a situation where you know that what that person done to me that was unacceptable it was out of order and they deserved for me to challenge them on that and confront them and and i have a right to defend myself if somebody's attacking me you know what what's the what's your thoughts around that well it depends on what, what's going on i mean for example we don't let murderers murder we don't let rapists rape you know we don't let people violate 
things. I mean, <clears throat> they get, people don't know how to behave in society. We have to stop them. Yeah. Uh, we put them in jail because we don't know what else to do. I mean, we don't really know. I, I taught inside Sing Sing Prison, which is not too far from here, yeah. for eight years. And um, I always thought it was interesting. You pull up to the gate at Sing Sing, and there's this big sign that says, Sing Sing, New York State Correctional Institution. And I used to think, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't it be nice if we could go in here and get a correction? <laughs> <laughs> and you, but the, it, it's it, we don't know how to correct. You know, all we know how to do is, is stop and punish. Yeah. We know how to stop people and punish, and that's the punishment is that we take them away from society, we lock them up, and put them. I, I wouldn't want to be in prison, in good part because, um, well, if you could, if you were just really a kind of meditative monkeyish kind of life, but that's not what's going on. You got to deal with all these other insane people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. We just really, you know, had really bad circumstances that they grew up in very often, right? Yeah. So that, that's got to be the hardest part. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm reflecting on a situation in my own life where, um, you know, I'm 57 years of age. Um, and I, up until recently, I had never encountered a situation where I felt someone had actually attacked me. Uh, and there was, there was an element of, there was mal conscious the phrase i would use would be conscious malevolence it was deliberately nasty and dark um and it, it was it was a really really difficult experience because it was very personal and unjustified uh, it felt like that um and you know i reflected deeply on that and i thought well you know what was my contribution to that but i have come to the conclusion that you know you can encounter people in life who maybe don't see the world the way you see it, who are not following a spiritual program, who who may, you know, pick on you, target you for whatever reason. They may be jealous or whatever. It does happen. Um, and, and and I think, you know, um, I, I um, subscribe to the principles that we're discussing. Um, and you try very hard but at the same time you have to protect yourself and um you know i think jesus jesus said that you know you've got to have the cuteness of a snake and the innocence of a dove and I, and i think there's some wisdom in that is just being aware of what's around you as well do you know any thoughts around that well you know when i say do not defend <clears throat> first of all if somebody attacks your body you will defend your body yeah, yeah. For a very simple reason, you still think that you're a body. I mean, you're hanging out in one. So, <laughs> you know, as long as you're hanging out in one, you'll also believe it could be hurt. Yeah. So, you would do whatever you could to prevent it from being hurt. What the Course is saying is don't pr protect your silly e ego because yeah. the, yeah. Ego's, the yeah. ego is the non reality. Yeah, so, if you, get, yeah. if you get something offends you, it's like, why, why, would, why would that offend you if it's not true? You know, yeah. or. Yeah. Or you, some people get upset. You know, you have to look at what is it that gets upset. What the only way you can get upset is you have to have a setup. You set it up, <laughs> so you can get upset. You know, you have this this ego that could be a egos are very weak. Yeah, and that's they're easily offended. You know, that's another word off ended off and not you off the end. So you've lost your balance. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so many words are like that. If you just pay attention to what the word is really meaning. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's that's good. The you know making that distinction between the, the body and we are we are at this stage we are we are bodies. And if someone attacks the body, then you you need to protect and defend. Yeah, it. sure. You know, I get it's really about the ego. What which part of me is offended? Uh, and the ego will always take offense. The ego will always be upset. Oh but, yeah. Um, if you uh, you know central to this the, the whole teaching is, um, you know, if you can go beyond that and say well. You know, can I see this person as, you know, a brother, a sister? You know, can I go beyond that um, ego resentment and bitterness and response and attack? Um, that's the challenge, isn't it? And that's where you, that's where the, that's where the, the tire hits the ground, because it's so easy to say, well, you know, eh, you, you're, you're the enemy here. Um, look what you've done to me. Look what you said to me. <laughs> you know? The whole point is there, there is no enemy. You know, there's no, that, that this is my brother my, my brother may be making a mistake right now and, and I will do what I can to yeah. correct that but 
um, at the same time that that's true, why am I getting upset about it? It doesn't have to happen. And they, they say all kinds of vile things are being said about Jesus prior to his uh, crucifixion. And what does he do? Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> There's no defense. He doesn't look at us. You're making a big mistake here. I really am the son of God. And <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm conscious of the time, John. And I'm yeah, okay, you're, 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 your, your time is precious um, and you're going to be writing today. So we're probably worth just... Um, I mean, I could talk for hours. I really could. Um, yeah. And we've only, I mean, we've really only touched on stuff, um, do you know, but um, sure. um, just before we go, um, I, I'm just curious to hear it. To hear, I'm not asking you to do a performance or tell a joke or anything. Oh, I'm no. Curious, curious to know how the, the character of uh, Dr. John Baba Mundane came about. Uh, there's a, a fellow, he's a, he's a comedian, uh, so maybe beyond an under. Uh, several years ago, I think like 30 years ago or so, I was watching him do a presentation and I thought, well, I could, I think I could do that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I could do some things like that. I stole some of his stuff and comedians do that all the time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but I couldn't be him. So I, I thought, well, who am I? And I'm well, well, I'm a, I'm a professor. Uh, and, uh, so I'll be Dr. Baba John mundane my name is <laughs> i love the name i love the name <laughs> and uh just it, it most of it's plays on words yeah. you know so i just playing around with i was talking yesterday with somebody about their uh, cleaning out their skeptic system which really meant <laughs> play on septic system <laughs> you know, th that kind of play on words sort yeah. of stuff you know yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to do any of it. No, 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 it's fine. It's fine. No, I was just uh, curious to see what where, where that come from. I also also had mentioned in my introduction you were a pretty prolific poet, I would say. Um, I wondered if uh, if you might have to finish off uh, one of your one of your poems that you could that maybe encapsulates the course of miracles if you thought it had something handy. Oh, or... that's an interesting idea. Um I'd have known you were going to. I'm, I kind of put. It's just something I thought of off the top of my head here. Sorry to put you on the spot. If you had something, that would be a nice way to finish. You give me a second, I'll get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Somebody once took one of the poems that I had written, and um, it's based on the principles of the Course in Miracles. Perfect. And they, Perfect. they put it into a plaque. Ah, oh, wow. And I was at a church somewhere and they, and they handed it to me. So seeing how it's, it's, it's right here, right? So I can, yeah. I can. Let's go for it. It's called uh, Perfect Happiness Now. A day of grace is given me and now I do clearly see it. There is a light my eyes see not and yet my mind beholds it. Now do I see there is no loss when I have left illusions. The world holds nothing that I want. And so my choice is clear. I find it not by leaving here, but in the mind eternal. There is a place of timelessness where love endures forever. Here losing is impossible and vengeance has no meaning. Here God speaks clearly to his son and now his son does answer. God's will is perfect happiness. Who chooses against himself? God's will is perfect happiness for all sisters and little brothers. God's will is perfect happiness for all who will declare it. There is now nothing left to find. Perfection has been given. I move now forward home to God. Now is the last step certain. Wow, that's beautiful. That's beautiful, John. Fun. Yeah. Is that, that's one of yours. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. You well, never know. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to to speak with you. Um, you and, um, all the best in all, all your ventures, and maybe we could speak again sometime. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank Thank you so much. I really all appreciate right. it. Very very welcome. Congratulations, you. Yeah. All All the very best. Yeah. You too. I'll be in touch with me by uh, by email. Yeah. Yeah. De definitely. Definitely. And I'll uh, I'm going to I'll I'll put this up on YouTube and I'll put some links in for. 
for your your book and stuff as well. Oh, okay. People want to people want to get more information and, and start having a look at this. Uh, but, you know, I publish a magazine called Miracles. I should have had a copy of my magazine here. I don't. Um, I I'll put. Pardon? Sorry. Well, I'll put a link to your website. Yeah, put a link to the website yeah. and um, also. Um, the the ma the magazine is available digitally as well. So if you want to go across the pond, it's uh, yeah. pretty easy to do that. Yeah. Oh. Excellent. All right. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll put all these links below the the, the video. And um, thank right. you very thank you very much. All You're very bit. welcome. Thank yeah, you for my pleasure. Fun being Enjoy with you. Enjoy the rest of your day, and and uh, I hope you have uh, some interesting uh, thoughts for for writing. Yeah, I gotta finish a piece for Sunday. <laughs> thank you, bro. Good stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care.